Oh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Anna Marie White, Tatai Toda, Toi Māori Aotearoa, and it's my absolute honour and privilege um, to be chairing this panel here today with Ranui Ngārimu, a member of the Marsden Fund Research Group, um, who led the return of Tira successfully back to Aotearoa for us all to share uh, in today. And also uh, Jamie Tuta. <laughs> Uh, and also Jamie Tuta. It's hard to actually summarise Jamie because um, I've, I've, I've known Jamie for a very long time. Um, we went to school together uh, and Jamie has had a very influential career as a leader uh, for our people in Taranaki. Uh, he holds many roles. Um, but yeah, has led us to a more prosperous um, future um, in our, in our uh, rohe. So thank you, Jamie. So our talk today um, is going to be focused on introducing the writings of Te Rangi Hiroa. Uh, many of you would have heard mention of him this morning. Uh, he's a very important uh, tipuna for, for us three um, because we all are related um, to each other. Uh, and also Te Rangi Hiroa is an important role model uh, for anyone growing up in Taranaki or affiliated to Taranaki. Uh, we are very proud of him. And I think maybe today is an opportunity to just provide a, a, an introduction to him for those of you who may not be familiar uh, with his life, his contribution, and also the reason why he's important um, to the homecoming of Te Ra today. Uh, also, uh, we are going to talk about what Te Ra means to us as Māori uh, and what it means for a taonga of that magnitude to come home to Aotearoa. Uh, it is not simply uh, an opportunity to see our past, but it is also a huge opportunity for us to open a portal through time to see into the future through the ambitions, uh, the legacy, and the achievements of our ancestors. So where we're hoping to land today is with a message around the future. We might need your help around what, what will be our next mission if we are to take inspiration from the fearless um, and intrepid uh, voyages of our ancestors that brought them to Aotearoa. Just going to start the panel. I'll, I'll just move on to the couch. Um, but I'll just ask Jamie to introduce uh, this kiwaha that he gave to the exhibition. Is, um, and, and just to give flesh to, to the space uh, that our, our tipuna has, has opened up for us here. Well, kapai, kia ora tato. Um, Auntie Ranui sort of called me, and, um, and given the relationship and connection of Te Rangi Hiro, uh, in terms of really bringing Te Ra to the attention of uh, the world when he visited the British Museum and cited this important taonga. Um, and Te Rangi Hiro, of course, is a prolific writer, and we've been blessed because there is a large collection that is held in the Bishop Museum, but also uh, many of his papers uh, that we have copies of. And when I was thinking about a particular statement that reflected the journey of Te Rā and what Te Rā means for us as we bring Te Rā home to Aotearoa and then think about what Te Rā means for us moving forward, um, I was reminded of this particular kōrero, which is the shortened version, um, which, as you will see there, uh, really speaks about the fact that Te Rangihiro was very big on ensuring that, yes, we draw upon our past and we, we reflect that in our present, but also that we, as uri of today, of this, each whakatupuranga, each generation has a role to play to continue to evolve and to be the best we can be. And so, um, and I love the statement, and John and I were talking on the pai pai because, you know, kaua mā te koro ingo noiho, um, which is a unique sort of phrase, uh, phrase of Taranaki, which really sort of, when he, when he speaks about koro ingo, koro ingo is a deep uh, yearning and love that one has. And so that's his, that reflects uh, te koro ingo ki ngā tūpuna, you know, that sort of respect, that admiration that we have for our ancestors. Um, and then it talks 
about the fact that we can't just rest on their laurels, that we have a role and a responsibility to continue. Um, and, you know, in Ngari Mate, wera wera, and it continues on, Kaeke tātou ki ngā taumata, mā te puku mahi, mā te ngākau nui, mā te manawa nui. And it says that, you know, yes, you've got to work hard, but mā te puku mahi, um, you know, success will only be attained if we work hard. Mā te ngākau nui, success will only be attained if we have the passion uh, to be able to overcome challenges and barriers that confront us. And then the, the last piece, you know, mā te manawa nui. Uh, manawa nui is sort of being determined and having courage to do things um, that at times no one else wants to do. And so I, I thought about this whakatauki tanga kōrero. In Taranaki, we call them whakawai. Uh, whakawai. Um, it sort of reflects my auntie here in terms of um, the courage that she has had to embark on this particular journey. It reflects the sort of the ethic of Te Rangihiro, um, because he went to places that no other Māori had, had been before. Um, but I think it sort of reminds us of if we want to succeed in anything we do, um, then we mustn't be complacent. We must be focused and work hard. And I think, you know, what Tara brings us is that focus and that determination to further explore what Tara means for us in a modern contemporary context. Mm. So, koira te kōrero. Uh, Jamie, I, I think um, it would be really good to just provide a short um, um, summary of, of Te Rangihiro's life. Uh, I found this great image of uh, Te Rangihiro um, in the front here. Uh, and he's uh, his mate, Apirana Ngata. And they're uh, just down the road uh, at the 1906 International Exhibition in Hagley Park, uh, contributing um, their col our culture uh, to an international exhibition. But, we, but Jamie, tell us, tell us about um, Te Rangihiro, Sir Peter Buck. Where did he come from and, and where did he go? Well, Te Rangihiro came from Uranui. Hey. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, where we come, well, Ranui on her Ngati Mutunga side. So, you know, he's from Ngati Mutunga. And when I, when I think about Te Rangihiro, I think about him in the context of uh, the experience that his fire, his kuya, his kuroheke experienced. And what sort of amazes me about Te Rangihiro being of Ngāti Mutunga is the fact that he is of a tribe uh, that has been fearless. And so, just briefly, Ngāti Mutunga as a tribe, I mean, we left um, in large numbers from Taranaki in the 1820s after we'd had some interaction with our northern relations. Um, and so, but at that time, um, our people came together and they made quite courageous decisions to leave en masse, to head south to Kapiti, to Wellington, to the top of the south, and then eventually to Whare Kauri. Now, when I, when I think about that in today's context, could you ever imagine moving an entire iwi grouping from one geographic location to another? You'd, 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 you'd think it was impossible. So that context is really important because it demonstrates that there was a characteristic among our people um, back in those times which sort of carried through to Te Rangihiro, Tā Māui and others, um, that leadership capability. And so Te Rangihiro, what I love about him is that he emerged at a time where you know, we had journeyed far from home, we'd returned back to Taranaki, we had experienced uh, large-scale confiscation of our land he was born at a period, you know, with parihaka, the emergence of new ways of dealing with the challenges we had with non-violent action and the like. Um, and so he was born at a time where there was a bit of chaos. And, um, you know, he had an Irish father and a, a Ngāti Mutunga mother. And even that in itself at that period of time was unique. Um, and, you know, he writes about those unique aspects and, you know, what his father's people gave him and what his mother's people gave him. Um, but I think, you know, he's an outstanding individual because he emerged at a time of sort of chaos. Um, he emerged at a time where it was not easy for Māori, let alone a half-caste, to get ahead. Um, 
So that, that's, you, know, you can read about Tarangihiro. When I used to talk to our queers, and I had one of my uh, lovely queers, Te Winga. So she died when she was about 96. And um, I'd ask, I said, oh, kui, what was Tarangihiro like? And um, she said, oh, well, kaki mai ngā kui a he pākiki. He pākiki. So we know what a pākiki is? Ask a lot of questions. Um, so he'd come, he'd come back to um, Uranui, and we've got a lovely um, old house in Uranui. It's one of the last remaining um, houses of its type, and it had a dirt floor, an opal, small house. And so Te Rangihiro, I guess, you know, he would ask questions, he would inquire, so he had curiosity, and he gathered a lot of our kōrero for Ngāti Mutunga. Um, but my one queer, she said, well, you know, when he came back, I can't remember the year, he was a bit older then, she said, I was asked to escort him. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, then? Eh? Um, but so she spent um, a bit of time with him, and it was really interesting to get her reflections, because he had come back from Hawaii, um, and she was a young Māori girl, born and raised in Parihaka, living in Uranui, um, and she just reflected his humility, um, and the fact that the thing that was long-lasting for her was him encouraging her to be the best she could be. And I think, you know, this sort of links back, when I read through a lot of Tarangihiro's writings, particularly when he came back to New Zealand, it was very much around our people being successful, excelling, it was about excellence, um, but it was really about being Māori. And I think that was partly shaped by the leadership group that, that he was surrounded by at the time as well with Tāpirana um, and uh, his relation, Tā Māui and others. Um, but yeah, our, our old people, they, yeah, they just, ka kōrero mai ngā kuia, he, he pākiki. He was a pākiki. But, um, and I guess it's useful because without curiosity, without questioning, we won't always know, right? And I think so that is probably a characteristic that he was born with. So some of you might be wondering why um, we, uh, 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 these, these, these people from Taranaki indulging um, you all um, in these stories of, of, of our esteemed uh, tipuna. So this next slide here um, will actually provide you uh, with the explanation as to why a lot of our discussions today um, are, have, relate back to Te And I'll give you the moment just to read through. So this, um, this was published in 1924 uh, in the Transactions and Proceedings of the Royal Society of New Zealand. And um, this, state, this passage here, of, uh, this piece of writing here provides us with an excellent opportunity to, um, to introduce Ranui um, and, 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 and just provoke her a little bit because uh, Te Rangi Hiro, our, our, our esteemed uh, tipuna, thinks that... Um, Quite easy. Uh, plating, re replicating <laughs> tira could have been done quite easily. <laughs> um, so, from the perspective of 2023, um, please, Ranui, will you um, reflect on, on your journey of, of bringing tira to Aotearoa uh, and also project forward for what you hope this homecoming might give to us all? Sure. Kia ora, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my journey with Tera set out when I was doing some other work with Dr. Catherine Smith, and we were at the British Museum looking at Kahurarana. And um, <coughs> we had been there for nearly a week, and uh, Jill Hassel asked on our second to last day there if there was something else I'd like to see. And I asked if we could see Te Rā. And on our last day there, Te Rā was in the room. Well, we didn't see the whole of the cell because it was rolled up, but we did see a part of it. But that small part of that cell invoked something in me that I just turned to Catherine after I'd had a cry in the car, <laughs> I turned to Catherine and said, we've got to bring it home. And that was the beginning. And so the next step for us was to 
apply for some funding through Catherine, um, through Otago University to the Te Aparangi Fund, in which we were successful and then we started our research journey with <coughs> including Dr Donna Campbell and we picked up a lot of other people, employed them on the way to help us with our research. And the more we saw Te Ra and looked at it, the less we knew. <laughs> and it was, it is the genius, really, of our tipuna. And I think that if Te Rangi Hiroa had been able to handle it like we've been able to handle it, he wouldn't have made that statement. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing for me is that this is knowledge that we had, but we've lost. And so it is something that we need to keep working on to regain it or to um, be inspired by it and offer our solution to what we think we can do with Tera because we made some samplers. We had a hui at Arahura as part of our research. And the hono or the join in Tera was something we as weavers hadn't seen before. It was something new to us, but not new to our tipuna. So when we tried to do it we, as um, we were trying to get this hono together, there's a rhythm to weave in, and the rhythm was not there, so we ended up using tools. And I thought, well, our people use tools if they needed to. Maybe that's what they used to get the, um, the hono together. And, um, and it's those sorts of things. There are just so many questions around te rā for us as practitioners that, um, you know, just excited me, really. And, yeah, so we kept working on it, and then we thought, well, let's see if we can get it home. And so we made an approach to the British Museum, was there a possibility, which one person said it was highly unlikely or something to that effect. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's enough for me. Highly unlikely or highly impossible. There's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about it and we talked to institutions about it. And because it has no known evidential provenance, we ended up coming, not well, not quite ended, but because we hadn't heard back from other institutions that we'd approached, we came back to Christchurch. And I, I, I said to Catherine and Donna, let's go to the Christchurch City Art Gallery because I knew the museum was going to be closed for five or so years. So we came to the gallery and they said yes, and that's where the journey started. And... Um, I have to say that it, it ha hasn't been an easy journey, but it's been a really smooth journey, even though we call it ngā piki, ngā piki me ngā heke. Yes. But we had all that, but the journey was really smooth, and here it is today. Now, when we definitely knew it was coming, I engaged with Ngai Tua Huriri, and told them that it, what was happening and how, asked them how they wanted to be involved. And um, they made the decision of how it was going to happen. And you saw that unfold today. Just glorious, really. And also, we wanted to send somebody to go over and get it. So we asked Ngai Tua Huredi who was to go and get it. And they said, myself, and we took Joe Harawera with us here. Yeah, I wanted Joe to come because it's not, the sale doesn't belong here in Ngaitahu, 
Well, we hoped it did because we found a bug <laughs> on it <laughs> and we looked at this bug and said, yes, that's an ancient bug from Ngaitahu. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out to be a carpet beetle from <laughs> London. <laughs> yeah, missed that one. But anyway, um, so because there is no provenance and because we were bringing it here to the south, I knew there were going to be eruptions from my cousins and friends in the north. And fair enough to, they asked the question, why down here? And it's because there is no provenance. But I wanted to take Joe because Joe's well known across the motu and the work that he does. And to take us with me, a, a Mata Waka representative. So I was grateful for Ngai Tua Huriri for um, supporting and uh, that decision. And so Joe and I went to um, the UK and met up with the staff at the UK and they were, I was just overwhelmed with it. It was just so beautiful. The way that they had, uh, oh, we had, first of all, we visited Te Rā and we were joined by um, uh, Ngāti Rānana group and, a gr and some people, Kahu and her cousin. Kahu works at Auckland Museum and her cousin were over there and they joined us too. So we had a lovely group there. And we were able to, Joe was able to perform the rituals over Te Rā. And so the British Museum staff were then able to pack it up. And it came in a box. It was 276 kilograms heavy, the box was. And Te Rā weighs just under five kilograms. <laughs> so you can imagine how beautifully and how preciously it was packed. On the day we went back to put the lid on it, on Te Rā, I realised I hadn't thought about greenery and looked at Te Rā and I thought, oh, you're going home moko moko, but I had a piece of ponamu on, a green piece, I took it off him and the um, conservator fixed it into the box and it was able to come home with a tonga from here. So, and then it was just so smooth. And Nicole, the conservator that travelled with us, her and I ran from um, waiting lounge to waiting lounge or uh, in the airports to watch Ted R being loaded and offloaded. <laughs> we, um, oh, we went to, uh, sorry, we did go into Heathrow, into the cargo area, and um, watch Tedda being packed and loaded, ready to fly home. Mm -hmm. So that was the journey to get it here. But it's not the end of the journey, <laughs> it's just the beginning. Because for me, it's about bringing Tedda home so that everybody in this nation who has the opportunity to see it, can see it. And they can wonder over it. <coughs> they can be excited by it, just go and gar over it. Or like I heard a little kid say this morning, oh, it's just a sale. <laughs> 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 yeah. I thought, that's cute. <laughs> but they can... I want people to respond to it in the way we as New Zealanders respond to our special tonga. Because this is a special tonga. It is not just a sale. <laughs> it is something really unique and very, very special. And I'm glad it's going to have a journey to, other, to Auckland and... Um, being able to be seen by as many as can, that can see it. When it arrived here in the Christchurch City Art Gallery, we had three days of public viewing and the gallery took um, appointments and we had, over those three days, 
um, 274 visitors, but a lot of those visitors came back and back and back. Mm -hmm. So if we counted each repeat time, there would have been over 300 visits in those three days, maybe more. Um, so already it's excited a lot of people. And they, the people came from all over. There's people from Dunedin, from Pukitaraki, mm -hmm. from, <laughs> from Blenheim and um, Te Awhina Marae and Motueka. They came from Auckland. They came from the East Coast. They came from all over the country to see. Architects came to look at it. Waka people came to look at it. Nosy people came to look at it. <laughs> but it, uh, it was really wonderful to hear the questions and listen to the responses from those that were around the table at the time. And it's fair to say that as you listen to everybody's opinion about what they think something is, you learn a bit more. I learned a lot. I'm still learning about it. I love learning about it. And we were fortunate to be able to, um, as you'll see in the gallery where it's exhibited, we we're fortunate to be able to uh, have some names given for parts of Te Ra so that we could refer to them. And they're not, um, they're not naming those parts of Te Ra, they're names for those parts that we're using. And other tribes and, and um, sailors will have different names for them. And that's okay. This is what we got for Te Ra. And that journey started because we, um, as weavers, when we make something and we have a, we put spaces in our weaving, we called it puariari. And a linguist from Waikato told us that that was the wrong use of the word for this particular purpose. And so we searched out some new words for Te Ra that we could refer to and offer up for anyone else to use. But the group in the far north have um, been making um, replicas of Te Ra, and they have their own names for their parts. In Kei Te Pai Tena, that's all well and good. You know, that's the way it should be. When you make yours, <laughs> you'll have names for your parts as well. Yeah. So that's my condensed story of our journey. We hired, um, and you'll hear more about this tomorrow if you come back to our talk, uh, we hired researchers to pour through journals to look for evidence of provenance. We hired an American company to come and photograph it thoroughly. But what we didn't know was that our little computers wouldn't take <laughs> the massive photographs that they produced. So we had to get to Papa to help us with that. And um, we also employed Hukimati Howard to come and test the feathers so that we were sure that they were what they are. And just, yeah. So you can hear more about that tomorrow. We'll talk about the in-depthness of our, of our research tomorrow. Kilda. Thank you, Rānui. Uh, so one of the um, uh, unique responsibilities that we've been tasked with today uh, is to uh, encourage you to think about um, what impact Tira might have uh, moving forward uh, and we wanted to inspire you with another mm -hmm. writing from Te Rangi Hiro, uh, because as Jamie mentioned earlier um, real change comes through uh, determined effort, uh, sustained effort, perseverance, courage and also collaboration. Sort of referencing toya mai 
Um, and so we've got all of our master navigators in the room. Um, they're in this sort of, in the second row here. So after the talk, you can sort of accost them around um, these elements. But actually the symbolism here with toi and my um, and that whole sort of approach is about movement, right? And when you reflect on the corridor of Te Rangihiro here, um, what it speaks to, in my view, is having confidence um, and having belief. Um, and I think about, you know, our tūpuna traversing the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, they had belief in their abilities. They had confidence. They had the right mindset. They had the skills and expertise um, and the leadership capabilities. Um, and, you know, and that's inherent in who we are as a Māori. Uh, you know, our old people in Taranaki would say, Kare titua i hene o ngārangi no mua no i karehiti ai e koe. That when we are born into this world, we're born into a path. Um, and that's a belief system, right? So that tells us that if you believe in that, that if you have a belief that when you are born, your path is set before you, you will have the confidence to have the faith and trust in that occurring. And I reflect on, you know, Te Rangihiro's writings and Thanti Ranui sort of referencing that, you know, a lot of the stuff is actually our mātauranga Māori. We say, he kura ka una, he kura ka wākina. A kura is a treasure. Um, you know, they are often not seen and they don't reveal themselves to us until the time is right. Um, and I'm a big believer in things happen for a reason mm. and they happen at a time when they're meant to. Um, and so I think, you know, this, it's a bit like what Te Rangihiro is saying here, you know, moving into the unknown, it's hard, you know, when you move into a space of the unknown, there's fear, you know, if, if we don't know, we, we as people like to know everything. Um, then we like to know everything, you know, and some of us, and some of us do think we know everything. <laughs> But when you think about, and, I, and the, for me, ta -ra, it, it provides an opportunity to explore um, old knowledge which will be new knowledge because we, we are rediscovering that knowledge. Um, but it makes us think about um, what we might do differently from now forward. And I guess, you know, that's, that, that for me is, has been a challenge that Te Rangihiro has often sort of laid down. Um, and, you know, each of us individually have a role and responsibility. And so, you know, a call to action is always, when you leave today, uh, what are you going to do differently? Uh, what might you talk to your whānau or your friends about your experience here with Te Rā? Um, because for me, Te Rā at this point in time is really about nation building. And that was the corridor in our Fai corridor. And when we talk about nation building, it actually starts with acknowledging and recognizing the place of Matauranga Māori, the first knowledge systems of this of this land. Te Rangihiro would say, he said, when you have the ability to hear and sense uh, the language of the land, the waters, the trees, the rocks, you truly have an environment from which you can um, experience true knowledge. Um, and so, you know, the kōrero this morning about at the Paipai and Tara, I think it just... Tara has brought us together, um, but I think, you know, it's, it's really about how we might think differently and what each and every one of us might do. Um, and I look in the crowd, I don't know, you might be all ngaitahu, but, you know, there's Māori and non-Māori. <laughs> and iwi from around the country. <clears throat> I'm being provocative now, I just... Um, but, but, but it's about nation building, right? 
And so, and it's, it's Te Rangihiro, his, his whole emphasis when he left New Zealand. You know why he left New Zealand? Do we know why he left New Zealand? Because he could never achieve, he could have never achieved what he did here in New Zealand. And that's not good enough. And so, you know, and so Tara, I think, you know, there's all these connections about, yeah, his core all. About how do we evolve and change as iwi, as Māori, but also as a country. So, Kwira, I think, you know, and, and I think the wonderful thing about the arts and toy and um, Hotu talked about what is toy Māori, mm. and that's a, another wānanga. Um, but, you know, certainly from my engagement and experience with toy, um, it's a very good way to shift um, mindsets and to inspire good dialogue and discussion on kaupapa. Mm. So if uh, for any of you who might think that um, talking about an exhibition, um, making a significant contribution to the state of the nation, um, this last slide here, which is not from the writings of Te Rangihiro, um, but does respond to um, a recent event, uh, which is very important to us all. It's a statement that was listed in the, in the commentary for the Taonga Māori Conference, which was held in 1990, our Sesque Centennial Year, uh, and was a, a sort of a, a response or reflection to the impact of te Māori. Uh, now, I think um, we should all be aware of the impact of te Māori, um, particularly for the relationship between Māori and Taonga and uh, the revolution that it caused in New Zealand museums. However, um, I have always been very um, alert to the fact that te Māori was in what, uh, what Karapuki Tapu described as part of an international art offensive to create space for Māori to stand tall at home. So while te Māori went over to New York, a lot of activity was... Uh, took place on the ground here, and when Te Māori came back in 1986, the space had been created for, for the Tutangata movement. Mm. Uh, now, we do need to pay tribute um, to Kara Pukitapu, uh, who passed yesterday uh, and was mentioned this morning. Mm. So it's just, uh, some, just to provide some detail around that international art offensive, um, you know, it's very important, very interesting, or perhaps not a coincidence, uh, that Te Māori opened at the Metropolitan Museum in New York on the 10th of September 1984. And uh, what happened in 1985, Jamie? Mm. What did happen? The Treaty of Waitangi Amendment Act. That's right. Mm. And then Te Māori landed back in Aotearoa for Te Hokinga Mai in 1986. So Jamie, um, as our as, as the lead negotiator for uh, Taranaki uh, during the <laughs> treaty settlements, and it was a long one. It started when did when did it start? Nineteen eighty eight. Yeah. Nineteen eighty eight. How long did it consume us? Well, it's still consuming us. Yeah. Um, we're about to well, we're going through a process of ratification for our maunga at the moment. So hopefully that will all happen this year. Um, but I think to Māori, you know, this is this whole renaissance. Um, if we reflect back to, you know, the period of loss, you know, so that's a lot of that is the loss of land um, and authority and decision making in the 1800s. Um, coming through to that sort of renaissance period, which Tāpirana, uh, Te Rangihiro and Tā Māori were a part of. Um, and, you know, that's sort of the young Māori leader grouping at that time and what you know, the impact that they've had, um, which is very significant, you know, quite apart from some of the material cultural aspects. I mean, the fact that Apirana was able to encourage the building of a number of carved houses throughout the mutu, from Waitangi to Waitara at home, um, Takitemu and others on the coast. Um, so you had that period. Um, and of course, the war, the depression, you had the urbanisation that had occurred in the 1960s 
and then you know we had that that movement of what I call reclaiming space, um, and you know that was really led out by um, our protest movement. Mm. Um, and, you know, back in the time, I know talking to some of our relations who were part of that grouping, you know, they they were getting the hardest time from their own relations, mm. um, but we had that protest movement, so they were agitating. Um, and you know what was born from that was uh, the, the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975. We had the Reo, we had the uh, Spectrum claims, and and all of those sorts of things. Iwi Radio, Māori, Māori Television, you know the Waitangi Tribunal. Um, but you know, to Māori, I think was one of those key points in the history of our nation, where again going offshore recognising the beauty and importance of the culture of this place. Um, and I, I think, you know, I remember going in 1986 when it opened in Wellington. You're probably not allowed to do this, but there were about four of us kids in the back of the van in the boot with all of our queers at home. <laughs> we had about 16, 17 people in a 10-seater. Um, but, you know, you don't appreciate those things until you get a bit older to understand, um, again, you know, particularly my generation, we're very fortunate for the foresight and the courage of leaders like Kara um, and the tohiki that we see before us in terms of what they have provided uh, for us today. Um, and so to Māori, I think, you know, it's one of those sort of pivotal moments in the history of our nation because who would have thought, again, here in New Zealand, um, that an exhibition showcasing uh, Ngā Toi Māori would attract so much attention in the United States of America. Um, and so again, reflect on that, right? Um, but e kore uh, a muri e hokia. Again, this is another step forward. And I think today with Te Rā coming back is another step so you know we've done we've gone so we've gone too far to go back, and so um, having confidence that we can continue to go forward is really important. Mm. And Kara, Kara was I mean it's just talking with um, you know about Kara, um, and you know we've we've talked about Tarangi Hiro, we've talked about Tama, we Pumare, Apirana, you know that leadership group, you know Kara, uh, Matua Fatarangi. Who else do we have? Yeah, and um, and Hirini, you know, when when I think about those three and the impact that they had on Te Ao Māori for their generation, um, outstanding, you know, across both you know culture, Māori development, and the arts. Um, and so I guess you know it's who's the next three or four. Or is it something different for tomorrow in terms of how we continue that legacy? Um, but, you know, we often don't acknowledge the contribution that people make until they die. Um, and, you know, with, with Cutter's passing, he's had a huge impact on Te Ao Māori. So we've, we've, we've put, um, we've given you a big, a big uh, responsibility here uh, to think about your futures. Are there, is there any questions or comments that you'd like to share? Tēnā tātou, kia ora mai te whare ko te rāroa, uh, kai whare tēnei mihi kautuana, tēnā rā, tēnā rā kōrua. I'm taken um, with the idea, Jamie, that you've reminded us that Te Rangi Hiroa went to Hawaii and then he came back. That the Te Māori exhibition toured the, you know, North America, <coughs> excuse me, and then it came back. And the very important wero was posed to us this morning, um, when will it be time for Te Rā to return and to come back permanently? Um, I think about the idea that uh, we can mihi to this taonga and as a, as a catalyst uh, for bringing people together and the feeling that it will be for it to return to the other side of the world. And I wondered uh, both your thoughts about when the time will come for our taonga to be returned permanently. <laughs> just a just the easy question. <clears throat> well, <laughs> we've got some ideas though. You could just like someone said, make the replica. <laughs> well, that um, you know, that's always in 
the back of our minds. But to get it home, we had to promise to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> and we um, had to ask Tatipane to sign his life on the line as in a letter of comfort as, um, you know, to assure the British Museum that we will bring it back and we will take it back if that's what we've got to do. We will take it back because we're lucky to have it in the first place. And while I, I um, understand your part, I, I don't want it to go back, but I will take it back. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, Tara is more than the physical tonga we have, right? Yeah. Um, and if we truly want to be a living, dynamic culture, then we take and we, we're inspired by Tara, and Tara lives on through the practice, mm. the understanding, the learning of being able mm. to apply, you know, some of the hono or the techniques. Um, and so it would be wonderful for Tara to be housed in New Zealand, to be experienced by our young people in the mutu. But I think the, the key thing for me is um, it's more than the physical object. Yeah. That actually Tara for me is a bit of a reawakening around that mm. practice um, and, and challenging us to sort of continue that particular practice. Mm. So um, it goes back to Tarangihiro's statement because you can argue that by just resting on the fact that we've got te rā at home, it's all good. Because that's telling us and all of our weavers and, and all of those who are experienced in the practice and the art form that it's actually about the practice and how that evolves and how we utilise that knowledge and that mā tauranga that Tara has brought home to us. So yeah. I think that for me is more important mm. right? um, because that ensures that that culture and that mātauranga lives on. Yeah. Oh, look, I used to work for the museum uh, for Te Papa Tonareva for 14 years, from 1992 to 2006. Um, and I said this on the uh, radio uh, New Zealand um, uh, airwaves as well. Um, so it was at a, at, at a time that Te Papa was transitioning from the Dominion Museum down into the new museum. Now part of that was a tonal, uh, was a loan uh, to the British Museum uh, for the sale, uh, for the day one uh, exhibition openings at Te Papa Tonarewa. Uh, in February 14th, uh, 1998. Um, so the loan was sent out on various occasions. Uh, it was always declined by the British Museum uh, because of the fact that they feared that if they were to give uh, the loan of the sale uh, to the National Museum, then we would have our, um, our artists, our Māori uh, people that uh, would say, nope, leave that sale here. And so that, that was one of the um, uh, concerns at, the, uh, at that particular time. Now we fast forward into 2023. Here we are um, at uh, the behest of a Tohuna Rarana Fatsu and also uh, the chair of He Afitikana Joe Harawira uh, as artists going over to uh, negotiate with the British Museum to return the Ra back uh, to us so we could see it in all its physical form. Um, and for our expert uh, navigators uh, and waka, kaupapa waka people uh, to comment um, as they are the practitioners uh, of the art form of using those sails. So I think um, it's a great um, opportunity uh, for us uh, to actually marvel at uh, what's what's been achieved uh, from that time uh, to now. So, um, 
yeah, I'm very grateful to the British Museum for allowing uh, us to actually see in person because it's hard to identify through photographs uh, at the scale uh, of that sale. And just conversing with our Waka people um, this morning, uh, even they can't believe the, um, the skill and technique uh, used to um, uh, create that sale. So just adding to the discourse of the, the uh, discussion here. Kia ora. I think on that note, um, I would like to encourage you all to come to the Kaiwaka TD panel, uh, which will be held in this room at 2.30 this afternoon. Uh, we have um, our expert navigators uh, sitting on the panel today, and we're hoping that they will give us some insight uh, on what it means to be in the middle of the ocean. Um, and so hopefully that, 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 that view will, um, will inspire you further. Um, but uh, what I can say is um, they do know where they're going. <laughs> hey, um, I'd just like to provide this opportunity for you to, um, to acknowledge Jamie and to say thank you again to Ranui um, for creating this opportunity, um, which is, as we've said already, um, a testament to uh, your determination, uh, your courage, uh, your stamina, um, and your magnificence as, uh, as a diplomat and a representative of our culture. Kia ora rānui.